Um, so, to use Esther's word, I have sort of been collared into this. So, <laughs> um, this, this came out of a, a little remark I made to Dad, who was telling me about Esther coming. Um, and, and I said to him, well, it, I think that that's what the romantic poets have been talking about ad nauseum. Um, and I told him about the painting that was on the front of the, the um, booklet that many of you have seen, The Wonder Above the Sea of Pop. And I promised Esther that I'll speak about it on the condition that everybody here knows that I'm no art historian, I know much about visual art. <laughs> um, but I am going to talk about poetry this morning. Um, and I'm going to try and talk outside of the colouring, which is to say I actually think that all literature at least that I've ever encountered, is about this. Um, and I want to try and explain why. So I promised that I would, um, I guess the pamphlet went out with Romanticism on it. So I, I'm going to address a, a poem from Romanticism today, but I'm also going to talk about some other literature. I want to say, first of all, um, in response to what Esther said, um, that I remember as a girl, in a, a young woman, late teens, early 20s, um, going perhaps to, to one of these churches that um, had bought into a way of thinking that wasn't nourishing my soul, now I know why. But I can remember thinking to myself, why is it that I feel utterly transfixed by poetry and bored in church? Why is that? Why are, I can remember reading um, T.S. Eliot's Proofrock. And, and sure, there's that kind of channel for teenage angst in that poem, but I remember thinking, I've just bumped up against something that isn't myself. I've just bumped up against something that's real. Um, so I guess I want to talk about why that is today, that literature might have been transforming, and what it can offer and speak into this space. Um, I'm going to start with um, an American novelist called Flannery O'Connor. Um, I could just as easily have picked, I think, anything that the great Australian writer Tim Winter, Winton has said, but for the moment I'm picking Flannery O'Connor. Um, she writes this, whatever the novelist sees in the way of truth must first take on the form of his art and must become embodied in the concrete and human. If you shy away from sense experience, you will not be able to read fiction, but you will not be able to apprehend anything else in this world either. Because every mystery that reaches the human mind, except in the final stages of contemplative prayer, does so by way of the senses. Christ didn't redeem us by direct intellectual act. I'm just going to say that one more time. Christ didn't redeem us by a direct intellectual act, but became incarnate in human form, and he speaks to us now through the mediation of the visible church. All this may seem a long way from the subject of fiction, but it is not. For the main concern of the fiction writer is with mystery as it is incarnated in human life. And I think this goes some way to explaining why, as a, um, as a young woman, I found literature so transforming because it required my body to, I'm not going to say understand it, to inhabit it. Because when you listen to poetry, as I'm always telling my girls, you need ears before you need a mind. You need to listen to it. You can't understand poetry without having a set of these, and sometimes these. You can't understand fiction unless you yourself have lived a life and can empathise with the form that is the novel. You need a body. You need to have lived a human life. Um, so I think that's possibly why I found that transformative. So, Flannery O'Connor. Um, the next thing I guess is when Dad told me that I was to talk about romanticism, um, a part of me wanted to rebel. I am the oldest daughter. <laughs> um, but, but because also Shakespeare, also T.S. Eliot, also Gwen Harwood, you know, I think it's bigger than this. So I guess I wanted to start with Shakespeare, who I think has ta ta taught me the most of all about um, a, a writer's obsession with epistemology and why that might be. You've all heard of this, roughly the story of Othello, yes? Mostly? Okay. Othello is mostly told, for those of you who don't know, in, in either year 10 or year 11. Um, and it's an utterly transfixing play. Um, but there's one 
bit that um, I'm obsessed with, and it's very early on in the play. Um, for those of you who don't know the story, Iago, who is a Machiavelli, he's a horrible person. All he wants is power. He is amoral. He wants nothing. Does that make any sense? Except for power. Um, Iago and his sidekick, Rodrigo, decide that they are going to upset the apple cart of this guy called Brabantio. And they're going to tell Brabantio a big fat lie about his daughter Desdemona. Desdemona has married in secret um, the Moor Othello. But what they're going to do is they are going to um, turn Brabantio's mind. They're going to try and make him crazy. So they imagine this, you're sitting in the audience and you come into a dark set. You can hear the sounds of Iago and Rodrigo talking and you can hear their plans. As an audience, probably what you're going to be thinking is, I don't know who that is. Like, what are their names? What are they, what, like, that's what we do, right? We try and work out a plot, <laughs> don't we? Who's talking to who and where are we, is what we want to know. Um, but the set is dark. And so they go up to Brabantio's house and they start talking to him. And one of the first things that Brabantio says, because they're like making this big loud noise, they kind of smash him out of his slumber. He's asleep, right? So if you can think about that dramatically and symbolically for a minute, he's asleep and he wakes up and he, and he says, what is the reason of this terrible summons? What is the matter there? I think Shakespeare's playing a little trick here. I think this is what is called a metatheatrical moment. What is the matter there is the thing you're also asking. You are also trying to perceive. You also can't work out. By the way, Othello, the main character, hasn't even turned up yet. You're trying to figure out what's going on, just like Rodrigo. Does that make any sense? So this matter that we're talking about, that Rodrigo is like, I don't know what's going on. Neither do we. And this is the point. Shakespeare is illuminating to us, and I mean to use that word illuminate in the darkness. You're a knower. You might think that Brabantio is a fool. Turn around and look at yourself. We are all knowing or apprehending in the process of apprehending. And it's a miracle, I think, is what Shakespeare's getting at. And Brabantio says in a panic when he hears that his wife, sorry, that his daughter is gone, he says, strike on the tinder, ho, give me a taper. Call up all my people. This accent is not unlike my dream. Belief of it oppresses me already. So he's already thought my daughter might be escaping out the door and he thinks, oh my goodness, the story I've heard has reflected back to me what I thought I knew. So it's actually about knowing. It's actually about what I have brought into existence in the act of knowing. Um, and I do think that, imagine it, this dark set, the asking for a light, the light, represents what I want to know, the thing that is just in front of me. I can only see what is just in front of me. I can't see what's in the darkness. Um, okay, so I think what I want to say about the particular genius of literature is that literature is about knowing, as in you, you just saw that in Othello. It's about knowing, and it is knowing. As the plot unfolds, it, the plot itself unfolds in front of us so that we can know it, but it also reveals our act of knowing in a kind of a side wink. There's a, um, there's Poppy over there. We have a friend called um, Kate Flaherty. She's amazing if you ever get the chance to listen to her, but she often quotes a, a Shakespeare um, critic who talks about it as double vision of being able to see the plot in front of you, but also being able to see yourself seeing the plot. Um, the characters we come to know just as we come to know that we are knowing. Um, I promised I would talk about the romantic poets. I really loved, Esther, your um, boo and yay list because I think they would have had the same boo and yay list. For those of you who don't know, the romantics were writing roughly from about 1780 to 1832, although some of the writers in the late 1800s would also probably call themselves romantics um, or at least have the same set of beliefs. But ultimately, what these writers were talking about, their bugbear was the Enlightenment. They were cranky about it in whatever form, um, which they felt atomized and cruelly squeezed out all that was human out of a human. Um, and if you pick up any writer writing in that period, that's what they're writing about. 
I loved Esther that you asked us to look at our own lives and where we had seen that because I think that's what they were doing. William Blake, you all know that you remember the chimney sweeper poems that you might have learnt when you were little? Um, those horrible poems about these tiny children who'd been shoved up chimneys. Um, he was cranky because we were treating children like an atom, like a thing, like a commodity. You can see how, how this was manifesting itself in the late 1780s. Um, Mary Wollstonecraft and the Vindication of the Rights of Women, she's cranky because this is what the Enlightenment is doing to women, where things put in bird cages is her persistent metaphor. Um, so, so there are some writers who are writing about protest, you know, and they're cranky about the things that have been put on the yay list because they think they're boo, if I can steal that, Esther. And I also think, and I'm gonna, go here because I think this is where dad wanted me to go. We also see it in Coleridge's Melancholy. Um, and I'm going to read Frost at Midnight again. I was a little bit trepidatious about reading that because I know at Gospel Conversations I've spoken about that before. Um, but we can see it in his shrinking sense of self in the first half of Frost at Midnight. Um, I also just wanted to give you a little bit of a plug for Jane Austen, who I think is also playing a game of knowing. Um, <laughs> I'll never forget when, sorry about this, I just have to plug it, just once. Um, Mansfield Park, I hope you've all read it. Have you read it? Yeah. You have to read it. Um, she plays these games with you, Jane Austen, this very wink, 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 nudge, nudge, you know. <laughs> um, halfway through the novel, the, all the way through the novel, you think that Fanny, the main character, is um, poorly treated, Everyone else, else around her are buffoons. She is the only sane person. They are rich and cruel and horrible. And then Austen pulls a Swifty. About halfway through the novel, she yanks out of Fanny's consciousness and puts you somewhere else. And all of a sudden, you see you've been, what you think is truth is actually inside Fanny's head. And all of a sudden, you see actually Fanny's a bit of a complainer. Actually, if there is an actually. Do you see? So she's playing these games of knowing with you to remind you that you are a knower, as are the characters. Um, anyway, enough of that. Um, but it also found expression in its examination of the mind. And I suppose this is where I think Dad wanted me to go. Um, that I think that, that, that romantic poets were obsessed with the power of the human mind once it is re-engaged with the body, what it can discover. And it's shocking. Once the mind is released, and I think this is what Coleridge and Wordsworth were getting at, this is the closest we come to being Imago Dei made in the image of God, when we relax into the, the bounded knowingness that is to be a human being. I'm gonna read Frost at Midnight. I told you um, that the first half of this poem is um, I think perfectly captures the melancholy that might come from living within this, what did you call it, Esther, the D-E-D? -D, de defective epistemic default. Okay, if I can just put that in your mind as I read the first half. I'm gonna read it in two sections, actually, if that's all right. Okay, so this is Sad Sack Coleridge. The frost performs its secret ministry unhelped by any wind. The owlet's cry came loud and hark again loud as before. The inmates of my cottage, all at rest, note the word inmates. The inmates of my cottage, all at rest, have left me, left me to that solitude which suits abstruse amusings, save that at my side my cradled infant slumbers peacefully. Tis calm indeed, so calm that it disturbs and vexes meditation with its strange and extreme silentness. Sea, hill and wood, this populous village, sea and hill and wood, with all the numberless goings on of life, inaudible as dreams. The thin blue flame lies on my low burnt fire and quivers not. Only that film which fluttered on the grate, still flutters there, the sole unquiet thing. Methinks its motion in this hush of nature gives it dim sympathies with me who live, making it a companionable form whose puny flaps and freaks the idling spirit by its own mood interprets, everywhere echo or mirror seeking of itself and makes a toy of thought. I'm gonna stop there for a second. It's extraordinary, isn't it? You can see here, I'm not gonna go, the whole thing is, if I picked one line, I could blow your mind. Like it's, he's just, 
I don't believe he wrote this stuff high. I just don't believe it. Um, you can see here that image of constriction, the inmates. You can also see it set against. This is a beautiful, by all accounts, postcard picture perfect. I mean, he's sitting in a cottage. It's snowing outside. He's got his baby sleeping next to him. What is his deal? Like, that sounds perfect to me. And yet this unquiet and that sibilant hissing sound, something is up. Something is up. Why? Why is the question, I think. Where is this unquiet coming from? And I think the key is in this last bit here, by its own mood interprets. He's locked inside himself. Because if we take Esther's account and, and go from there, living in this DED locks you out from any other human being. It locks you out from anything that is outside yourself. The only thing that the Enlightenment has to offer, actually, is solipsism, ultimately, which means we only interpret ourselves by ourselves. It makes a toy of thought. Yeah, he goes on. So he's, these things aren't great. And then he takes a trip back to his childhood. And here is the key, actually. Here, I think he comes close to telling us where all this came from, where this unquiet came from. But oh, how oft, how oft at school with most believing mind, presageful, have I gazed upon the bars. There it is again, that image of imprisonment, to watch that fluttering stranger. And as oft with unclosed lids, already had I dreamt of my sweet birthplace and the old church tower, whose bells, the poor man's only music, rang from morn to evening all the hot fair day. So when he's at school, his mind is elsewhere. He's daydreaming of being back in the paddocks with his friends. So it's almost this, the, the double skipping of the human memory, right? Um, so sweetly that they stirred and haunted me with a wild pleasure, falling on my ear most like articulate sounds of things to come. So gazed I, till the soothing things I dreamt lulled me to sleep and sleep prolonged my dreams. And so I brooded all the following morn, awed by the stern preceptor's face, mine eye fixed with mock study on my swimming book. I'm just going to stop there for a second. So he's in school. He can see the bars. He's supposed to be studying. And all he can think about is daydreaming about being elsewhere. You see? The stern preceptor, I think, is this image of the Enlightenment. Learn your stuff. Fill your head with facts. I think that's what's going on here, right? And what it does is it introduces thought. We had toy of thought, and now there's mock study and a swimming book. This knowledge isn't real. This is fake. This is an ephemera. And then he says, save if the door half opened and I snatched up a hasty glance, and still my heart leaped up, for still I hoped to see the stranger's face. Townsman or aunt or sister more beloved, my playmate when we both were clothed alike. I'm going to stop here just for a second. Did you hear how many personal pronouns there was, the me and the I? Can you see that just on the screen? Even if I don't flip back to the other standards, you can see it all right. The self is locked in the self. The me, the I, the me, the I, the me, the I. Longing for elsewhere but can't get out. So I think Coleridge is linking this obsession with facts and knowledge, not only with the fact that it's locked him inside himself, but that intense loneliness that comes with that. Um, now, I've spoken about this before, but just very quickly, Coleridge was a reader of Genesis. Um, he knew that the stories in Genesis were shaped like a chiasm, which means if you know anything about a chiasm, I think it's the most exciting thing I ever learned at theological college. But basically, if you're looking for the meaning, it's in the middle, it's not at the end. So in, in Hebrew scriptures, the point is the meeting place. The point is the coming together, right? So I think we're at the meeting place of the chiasm here. That's where we are. Um, we're at the middle. But anyway, let's circle back to that. So his mind, if I can just recap, Coleridge's mind has gone from himself to his baby to his child self, and we're still at his child self, yeah? Okay, watch the chiasm, the switch. This is the switch. Dear babe, <laughs> I never saw this when I was at school. I just think it's the coolest thing ever. Can you see how he's gone from this kind of self-reflective looping thoughts of self-pity 
to a direct address outside himself. Dear babe, that sleepest cradled by my side, whose gentle breathings heard in this deep calm, fill up the interspersed vacancies and momentary pauses of the thought. And now there are no more personal pronouns. They're gone. My babe so beautiful, it thrills my heart with tender gladness thus to look at thee and think that thou shalt learn far other lore and in far other scenes. You will not go to school in the Enlightenment like I did. For I was reared in that great city, pent mid cloisters dim, and saw naught lovely but the sky and stars. But thou, my babe, this is the I gone to the thou, but thou, my babe, babe, shalt wander like a breeze by lakes and sandy shores beneath the crags of ancient mountain and beneath the clouds which image in their bulk both lakes and shores and mountain crags. He's preaching now. So shalt thou hear, shalt, so shalt thou see and hear the lovely shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters, who from eternity doth teach himself in all and all things in himself. Great universal teacher in contrast to the stern preceptor. Great universal teacher, he shall mould thy spirit and by giving make it ask. I don't know if you can see that sneaky little image there. We went to Canada recently and if you go to a glassy lake that's by a mountain, you can see that mirror image. Do you know what he's talking about there? And if, if, the, if the water is glassy enough, it actually looks like there's two of them. That's what he's talking about there when he says, the ancient mountain and beneath the clouds, which image in their bulk both lakes and shores and mountain cracks. So the idea there is that the mountain is speaking to the lake, which is speaking to the mountain, which is speaking to the lake. So instead of solipsism, of that being trapped inside of the human mind looping around itself, this is something altogether different. This is an outward movement of the human spirit. This is what creation is showing him, I think, right, of the two elements of nature speaking to each other, just as the poet is speaking to the child. There's an imaging going on. Note also, it's gone from the father to the son, or father to the child, to the child. I wonder where we're going now. So there's this reciprocity, was Esther's word. There's a reciprocity that's going on, or a returning to, I think, where God wanted us to be escaping the enlightenment. This is how we do it. We move out of ourselves and encounter. And look at this last little bit. This is where I think he's really preaching. And I do think he's, he's pulling his language from Genesis and he's pulling his language from John on purpose, I think. This bit here, um, the eternal language which thy God utters, who from eternity doth teach himself in all and all things in himself. So again, there's that reciprocity. Great universal teacher, this is my favorite bit, he shall mold thy spirit and by giving make it ask. And so we're back in communion with God rather than being locked in, in that inmate, that um, stuck in that kind of eternal loop that empiricism would invite us to be in. And then he finishes like this. He gives a benediction. So he, we've returned to the man, right? From the man to the child, to the child to the man. So the structure just like the image of the, um, of the, lake, and the, the lake and the mountain is, is telling us how to read this, I think. Therefore, all seasons shall be sweet to thee, whether the summer clothe the general earth with greenness or the red breast sit and sing betwixt the tufts of snow on the bare branch of mossy apple tree, while the night thatch smokes in the sun thaw, whether the eve drops fall heard only in the trances of the blast or if the secret ministry of frost shall hang them up in silent icicles, quietly shining to the quiet moon. And you can, hear, can you hear how quiet that language becomes at the end? There's peace. He's found peace. And you can hear it before you can apprehend it intellectually. You can hear the peace. Um, I also just want to point out, can you see how he's brought all the seasons together there? The, the spring, the autumn, He's drawn all of it together. And I do remember my dad telling me this. I think I, on, on occasion when I was, Poppy was there actually, I think I once told my dad when I was in year nine that I thought Shakespeare in college was stupid. Um, but, and I remember his retort and pointing this out to me. Can you see here how the light 
The light comes from the moon, which is itself reflected, which reflects onto the icicles in this kind of giving loop. The final party trick of this poem, to me, is a bit like the one Shakespeare was playing on us, which is that, yes, this is about a communion of the poet with his son, absolutely, and about the healing, um, breaking open the trap, I suppose, of enlightenment thinking, but it's also about us communing with the poet. It's also about the poet's mind drawing together um, elements just like here. We've got the frost. The ho <coughs> Any of you seen hoarfrost? I, I've only seen it because my husband's Canadian. It's astonishing and it needs particular circumstances for it to occur. It has to be the right temperature. It has to be the right humidity. It has to be no wind. And then all of a sudden you wake up in the morning and there's this miracle everywhere. It can be like an inch thick on everything, these crystalline diamonds. This is the point. All of it is coming together in relationship, in connectedness, and the miracle occurs. Just as in, in the poet's mind, we're able, and in the human mind, I think Coleridge would add, we draw together and something crystalline forms. We're able to participate in what it is to be like God. I promised Esther I'd talk about this. This is um, Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog, isn't it? It's 1818, so he, he would be a romantic. He was German. Um, I wrote this down, there's a particular, uh, there's a German word for this. It's called Rückenfigur. Does anyone speak German here? <laughs> so you're happy if I murder it? <laughs> um, um, what it means is, is that it's a painting of his back our eye is for first drawn actually to the clouds. And you can see the composition of it drawing our attention secondarily to this man's back. It's weird in some ways. What is the painting of? Is it a painting of the clouds, in which case he's in the way? Or is it a painting of a man admiring, thank you. Or is it a painting of a man admiring? Like, what is this painting about? I'm stealing this from a student, the next thing I have to say. I actually wonder if this painting is about a double perception, about the miracle of perception, about the connectedness of, human, of God's creation with the apprehender. The thing that we apprehend is connected with the apprehender, if that makes any sense. What we perceive is connected with the perceiver, and that's where the miracle is. It's in a connectedness, in the outward movement of both. And then there's the double perception. Actually, what we have here is a bunch of perceivers looking at the perceiver, looking at the perceiver perceiving. That's what this moment is. And so we're in a communion of perceivers. In romantic, um, they often, you've heard the, the, the um, idea of the sublime, what is extraordinary, the thing that, that we are in awe of. So this man is obviously in awe of what he can see and it's extraordinary. But I think Caspar David Friedrich is saying, so is the fact that you can perceive. That is just as cool, maybe more. Maybe it makes it whole, the fact that I can look at you all and there's a meeting in the middle, if that makes any sense. Um, I'm gonna stop here. That um, writers regularly rail against what Denise Levitov calls poisonous luminescence. I think she's talking about empiricism, in my opinion or the sacred lock of its cell broken, she said, or Virginia Woolf sardonically calls a sense of proportion. I don't think she's been kind. Um, Gwen Harwood calls it black everlasting flowers. These are poets trying to get out of an empirical lock. They're railing against the impulses of empirical thinking and how it locks us up. Instead, they invite us into encounter, to hear it, to feel it, and in the reading to connect with each other. So, I think that poetry and fiction invites us to use our bodies, to be bodies, and the mind follows, and then the mind can discover what it does not yet know. So it's almost to me as if the poet is waiting for you on the other side of that encounter. And I think that's, as a girl, that's what I bumped up against, is T.S. Eliot's invitation to encounter what yet I did not know. So I hope that makes sense. I hope, Esther, I've accented. I was going to talk about Ozzy Mandias because I went to a Paul Kelly concert, but I'm not going to do that. Thank you.
triumph of a lazy man is to get your children to be smarter than you. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Sarah. Uh, infinitely gentle, infinitely suffering thing. Of course, the magnificent lines um, from Preludes, uh, which does uh, capture the theme of what we're talking about. When T.S. Eliot says, I'm moved by fancies that curl around these images and cling the notion of some infinitely gentle, infinitely suffering thing. And he was taking a walk through London and uh, ordinary things which he saw as glorious. Thanks a lot, Sarah. And um, that really, uh, what, what a poem. I think that really is one of the great poems of the English language from one of the great minds of the English language, but it does talk so much about the communion with the real and how transformative it is. One, wonderful. Okay, so we're going to, uh, we, we come back, what time did we say we'd come back? 11? We're a bit over. We'll give ourselves 20 minutes, and then Esther, the next session is all yours. Thank you.